So make sure you get your tickets and invite. With the addition of the new service here in Raleigh and at Apex, we have the capacity for about 24,000 people on Christmas Eve. And so when you invite someone, they may hear the gospel for the very first time. You actually may be used by God to play a role in the, their eternal destiny in heaven. How cool would that be, right? So pray, invite, show up, let's leave the rest up to God. And if you're thinking, I'm just, I just can't even get into the Christmas spirit, I got a little video that will help you get into the Christmas spirit. Just watch this. That's my grandson right there. Look how much he loves Christmas. That's Judah, Ma Michael, Judah, Michael. So anyway, so every time you need to get into Christmas, call me, I'll send that to you. That'll get you jacked up and you'll go out and invite people, right? Now, let me just say a word before I get into our message this weekend. Uh, this is the end of the year. This is when a lot of our giving comes in. This is where we finish in the black, and this is where we position ourselves to do incredible things next year. But I'm really pushing you to finish strong this year. I know a lot of you, you only give at the end of the year. A lot of people get bonuses, and, and, and you're thinking about your year-end giving, your charitable giving. Laura and I are going through this process also. Let me give you a few reasons why God could position us to do some significant things. First of all, uh, we've told you about our Agape campus down in Port uh, Prince, Haiti, how they already raised a half million dollars on their own to buy the property for their new campus. This is in Haiti, by the way, okay? We've already given them a gift of $100,000. We would love to bless them with another gift of $100,000, and we can do that if we finish strong financially, and I think you would want to do that. Many of you know Jim Hawking. Uh, for several years, we drilled wells in the uh, Central African Republic in villages where they had never had clean drinking water ever, and then we went in and started churches, and we saw God do some amazing things there. Jim now has the opportunity to drill wells in the outlying areas, the rural areas of Haiti where they have no fresh drinking water. It's going to cost about $70,000 for a drilling rig. And I would love for us to be able to give that to him as a Christmas gift. But we need to finish strong. You may be in a position where God has blessed you in such a way, by the way, I'd like to meet you, where you could just write that $70,000 check and give it to him. So listen, we want to finish strong. We're going to be launching a Spanish-speaking campus next year. And I'm going to say much more about this when we get into January. But to get ready for that, it takes extra resources. So pray about it, think about it, let's finish strong. And I believe that God is going to be glorified in some miraculous ways. Now this weekend, I am wrapping up our series on the 23rd Psalm, and I realize this time of year, people are here for all kinds of reasons. Some of you are here uh, just because you promised your mama that you would go to church on Christmas. That's so cool. Your mama's happy. I'll tell her, you know, I'll sign something if you want me to, but we're glad you're here. Some of you are here, you're kind of checking out the Christian faith, kicking the tires of Christianity. You want to see the difference, if any, that Jesus can actually make in a life. Uh, we don't care why you're here. We're just glad you're here as we wrap up this series. If you have your Bible to do that, I'm going to invite you to turn to Psalm 23. If you don't have your Bible, that's okay. We're going to put the verses up on the screen. And let's just read it. We haven't actually read. We've seen it in the video, but we haven't actually read the Psalm. So let me just read it to you as we set it up for verse 6 this weekend. Psalm 23, beginning in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. And then what we want to look at this week, verse six, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Goodness and mercy are going to follow me all the days of my life. And that's, that principle is easy to believe if everything is going great in your life. See, when, when, when our finances are good, we have a lot of confidence. We can say, surely goodness and mercy is going to follow me all the days of my life. You know, we can say that with confidence when our health is good. We can say that with confidence when our kids are behaving and they're doing a pretty good job in school. But all of a sudden when our body begins to break down, or all of a sudden when our kids are acting like monsters, or all of a sudden when we go to the ATM to withdraw $20 and the ATM lets us know we don't have $20, all of a sudden we have a hard time believing that surely goodness and mercy are going to follow us all the days of our lives. By the way, when David wrote this, when he uses this word goodness, he's referring to the blessings that God brings into our lives, often we aren't even aware of, blessing us when we don't deserve it. But he also, he's talking us that whether we realize it or not, God is at work. We may not realize it at the time, but God is at work in our lives and that he is a good God. Basically, that we follow a God who has our back. And when he uses the word mercy, he's referring to things like faithfulness, forgiveness, loving kindness, the grace of God, the things that God pours out into our lives on a daily basis. He's working with us. He's doing something. He has a plan 
for our lives. I love the way Paul put it in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. But you'll notice he doesn't say all things are good. He doesn't say that. He says, God uses all the stuff that's going on in our life, the good stuff, the negative stuff, the bad stuff, to work it out for good when we are called according to his purpose, when we are actually following him. He's at work in our lives. When we were uh, out a couple of days last week because of uh, 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 the snow, you know, uh, Laura and I had time to watch some TV together. And uh, normally when we watch TV together, honestly, it's HGTV. I'm, I, I'm not the king of my castle. I just want you guys to know that right now. But we, you know, we thought, man, let's, let's venture out a little bit. Let's do something exciting. So we turned on the Food Network. Now, I'd, I'd, I'd be honest with you. I don't really watch the Food Network. I can't cook a lick. Uh, I can make a mean grilled cheese sandwich. Other than that, I can't cook anything. I, by the way, I am not a renaissance man. Have you guys figured that out? I'm pretty much just a redneck, right? So I was kind of enthralled by this show. It was called Chopped, okay? And it's kind of a simple show. Uh, they invite some well-known chefs onto the show and they compete against one another for a cash prize. But the catcher is they give them what they call a mystery box and they open it at, at, at a certain time and they pull out all of these ingredients that make no sense whatsoever. In fact, I took a screenshot of the ingredients, Arctic char, pig ears, pizza, uh, and rhubarb. And, and basically, they said, you've got 30 minutes to go construct an incredible dish, and we're going to pick which one's the best, and you're going to win $10,000. And it was amazing what these master chefs could do with those odd ingredients. I mean, they had sweet and sour and bitter and salty. They had spicy. They had all of this stuff, but they could blend it together. And I'm watching that, and I'm thinking, man, that's kind of how God works in our life. He's like a master chef. Because see, once we begin to follow Jesus, once we respond to the gospel, once we invite Jesus Christ into our lives to be our savior, God takes us on as a project. And, and in Romans chapter eight, Paul tells us that his goal is to conform us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. In other words, he wants to make our character begin to match the character of Jesus, to love, to serve, to forgive, to accept as Jesus has loved, forgiven, accepted us. He wants us to become like Jesus. So he's taking us on in this project. And then Paul tells us this in Philippians chapter one, verse six. He says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, he who, who started this project in you will carry it on to completion. And basically Paul is saying that what God starts in your life, he is committed to finishing. And often to accomplish that project of conforming our lives into the life of Jesus Christ, he has to take us through some bitter times and he has to take us through some sweet times and he has to mix in some sour and some salty and some spicy times and he works it all together and he mixes it all together. And when the project is complete, when we come out of the oven, okay, we are his masterpiece. But you gotta understand, that is the promise that God makes to every one of us when we choose to follow him. This is what's interesting. David says in verse six that goodness and mercy follow us. They follow us. Now, if you've been in this series up to this point, you've seen basically that Psalm 23 talks about the good shepherd leading us. He leads us beside still waters. He leads us through the darkest valleys. He's preparing a table for us in the presence of our enemies. But he's leading, he's leading, he's leading. And we've talked over and over how important it is that we are following. Yet all of a sudden, David gets to the last verse of this psalm, and now he talks about the shepherd following us. What is that all about? Well, let me give you an example. Maybe, it, maybe it'll help. Years ago, uh, the boys decided they want a dog. And I'm not a big dog person just because they inconvenience my life. They mess up my lawn. If I want to go somewhere, i got to find something to do with them. And, and, and they cost money. So I'm thinking, if we're going to get a dog, I'm going to get a dog that does something for me. I'm not just going to get a dog... I'm gonna invest in, they're gonna to have to give back in this relationship a little bit. So I'm watching TV, I see a commercial, and there was this dog, a border collie that could catch a Frisbee. I'm like, I'll get one of those. He can entertain me. At least he's gonna earn his way a little bit, right? So I, I get this little border collie, it's a female, we name her Josie, and she's a cool little dog. I mean, in fact, she's smart. And right away, guess what? She could catch a Frisbee. I mean, she's earning her keep, right? Well, about two days into us having one of those little underground electric fences, I look out and she's gone. So I go walking through the neighborhood, Josie, Josie, and a lady walks by and rolls down her, or drives by and rolls down her window, and she says, are you, are you missing a dog? I said, yeah. She said, is it a border collie? I said, yes. Now, we backed up to a farm. She said, it's back at the farm herding the sheep. <laughs> well, I thought she meant injuring the sheep. I'm like, oh, great, I'm going to get sued. So I hop in my truck, 
and I go back to the farm and I get out of my truck and there is Josie, this puppy who's never been taught to do this, nipping at the heels of all these sheep. And in about two minutes, she had them gathered up together, standing at attention under a tree and she's laying there like, I am so good, right? I don't even know what I'm doing, but I'm so good at it, right? This is my moment, right? But I, 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 think, I think that's what's going on here. I think in the very same way, the good shepherd, as he's leading us, this is what he does. He unleashes two border collies, okay? Their names are goodness and mercy. And as the shepherd leads us, goodness and mercy, they're nipping at our heels. They're keeping us in line. And if we get out of line, if we get off the path that the shepherd is trying to lead us on, they get us back in line. You know what that tells me about our God? It tells me that not only does he lead us, and this is an incredible principle, he also pursues us. He pursues us. If we get off the path, he pursues us. You see this all the way through the Bible. I mean, you read the beginning, the story of Genesis, creation, chapter two, they focus in on mankind, Adam and Eve. By chapter three, they've screwed up everything, right? They disobeyed God, but you know what? Did they go looking for God? No, they were embarrassed, they were ashamed. What did they do? They hid themselves. God came looking for them. They didn't pursue God, God pursued them. And God found them and said, Adam, where are you? Literally in the Hebrew, why are you where you are? You've never hidden from me before. God knew what was going on. And they finally confessed, and what did God do? He took an animal, he killed the animal, he skinned the animal, he covered up their shame and their nakedness. It was kind of like a preview of a coming attraction. For man to be reconciled back to God, something's gonna have to die. Blood's gonna have to be shed. But God was already putting a plan together. You get to the book of Exodus, the very next book. You come across the story of a guy, a stumbling, bumbling, you know, stuttering guy named Moses, and God pursues him and finds him out in the Midian desert and speaks to him through a bush and says, you're gonna be the guy. I'm gonna use you to bring my people out of Egyptian bondage and you're gonna lead them to the promised land and read the story. Moses had every reason in the world why he was not the guy. He says, hey, listen, I'm a murderer. First of all, I murdered someone 40 years ago in Egypt. Don't think I should probably go by, back there. That's why I've been hiding out on the backside of the desert. On top of that, I've been out here with these sheep for 40 years. You know, I'm not a leader. I'm working for my father-in-law. What a dead end job that is. I can't even speak in front of people. God would not stop. God continued to pursue Moses. And you know the story. Moses became the deliverer. You see it in the New Testament and you read the story of, the, of Saul, how he was persecuting Christians, followers of Jesus, how he was putting them in jail, in prison. And Jesus pursued him and caught him on the road to Damascus. Remember that? And he says, Saul, why are you doing this to me? What's going on? And they had an encounter and Paul submitted his life to Jesus Christ and he went on and he wrote most of the New Testament. My point is this, we serve a God, yeah, he leads us, but not only does he lead us, he pursues us. By the way, understand this is the basic difference between religion and Christianity. Religion is all about man pursuing God. How can I somehow get back on God's good side? How can I get into a relationship with God? What can I do to restore the relationship? But Christianity is all about God pursuing God. Man, I was talking to a young man after church one, one weekend and I could tell he was standing off at a distance and finally I said, did you wanna to talk to me? And he said, yeah. I said, what's going on? And he says, I can't find God. I can't feel his presence in my life. I don't sense him at all. And so we sat down and I said, what's going on? And he, and he told me his story how he had made some really bad decisions. And one particular, he felt like God was saying, man, if, if, if you make that choice, I'm dead with you. You're dead to me. I'm done with you. And he said, I made the choice. And ever since then, I just haven't felt God's presence in my life. So I went back to the green room and I got my Bible and I went out and I sat down and I turned to Psalm 139 and I, and I said, read these verses and this is what he read. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Is I, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my beds in the depth, you are there. And you go ahead and says, if I go there, you're there. If I go over here, you're over here. And finally I looked at him, I said, listen, your problem isn't that you can't find God. Your problem is you can't get away from God. And you just hadn't come to terms with God. And so we talked and eventually he, he, he asked God to repent and he prayed and, and, he, and, and you could just see how the light came back on and he realized that God desperately wanted to be in a relationship with him and that God was pursuing him all along. And he was still hiding from God. Let me tell you something. We serve a God who leads us, but we also serve a God who pursues us. Goodness and mercy follow us all the days of my life. But you know what I thought about? And maybe it's Christmas, maybe that's why I thought about it. But once we become a Christian, once we are in the family of God, goodness and mercy should start to follow us. We should be taking it where we go. 
Paul talks about in Colossians 3, about how you take off the old, you gotta put on the new. This was your life before Christ. This is your life after Christ. It's things like forgiveness and loving kindness and generosity. He talks about all of these things. And this is what's interesting. We're pretty good at this, at this mercy and goodness stuff, you know, like maybe two days a year, Christmas Eve and Christmas. We're like Ebenezer Scrooge, Scrooge the other 360. But we can, everybody's nicer to each other, treats everybody differently. But see, for us, it's been called as a lifestyle. And I thought, you know where you can really, this, this is the test of whether goodness and mercy follows you as a Christian. How do you deal with people in the service industry? People that sometimes you think are a little beneath you, maybe not as smart as you. See, the waitress at Waffle House. The cashier at Kmart or maybe at Walmart. And you know what? I, I used to think I was pretty good at this. And, and in some ways I am. I mean, like I have this policy. I'm going to tip you 20%. I don't care how lousy you are. And I just have this mentality. And Lauren, I've talked about it. I never know that I could have a single mom who's got a sick kid at home. And maybe they're just having a bad day. So I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Or it's a college student who's working 40 hours a week and taking a full load. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe it's their first day. I'm going to give, so I'm going to, but if they're good, I'm going to give them more than that. And if I find out a little bit about their story, if I find out it's a single mom who's struggling or a college kid who wants to go on a mission trip, Laura and I will actually leave a tip that's larger than, than the bill, than the food we're eating, right? We will just do that. That's, that. So I'm pretty good at this, but boy, I just found out recently I got some room to grow. We were out in Phoenix. I was there with a couple of guys and I was at a hotel and, and we were waiting for a car to pick us up to take us back to, um, to the airport. And I usually try to get Laura a little something when I travel and she's not with me. So I went in a little shop there at the hotel and I walked in and the girl's on the phone. Jeff's down here. He was with me. She was just on the phone. Well, I, I'm very patient because there's, you know, there's mercy. There's goodness and mercy, right? right. Well, it's obvious that this is not a work-related call. I mean, she's just chatting away and she's talking to a friend about something and she would smile like this. And then, then she would turn her back and talk. I'm like, I can still hear you. I'm right here. Okay, I'm two feet from her, right? She wouldn't wait on me. And I just had a question about something before I bought it. And she kept talking and she kept talking. And she looked at me again. I said, hey, just forget it. It's obviously not that important. And I turned and walked out of the shop. And when I walked out of that shop, I went about three feet and I felt goodness and mercy. Just nipping at my heels like, hey, great example, Pastor Mike, you know. Way to be like Jesus, Pastor Mike. Of course, I'm rationalizing. Hey, I'm Phoenix. I'm never gonna see this lady again, right? But mercy and goodness would not give up. They would not back off. So I went back in the shop, still on the phone. And I stood there and finally she said, how can I help you? And I said, you can't. I said, I, I really got to run. However, I was so rude to you a while ago. And I, wanna, I just want to tell you, I'm sorry. I don't normally act like that. Would you forgive me? And she was so gracious. Like, oh, you don't need. I said, yes, I do. Yes, I do. And when I walked out of there, you know what I did? I knew that I had done the right thing and I had left her with a little bit of goodness and mercy in my wake. And I'll just say this because it's the holidays. Is there an area in your life where you need to do some goodness and mercy work? Where maybe there's somebody that you need to forgive. Maybe it's someone that offended you and they live with the guilt of that every day. Can you imagine what it would mean if you went back to them and said, hey, could we bury that once and for all? Could we move forward? I want you to know I release you from that. Can you imagine? Is it, maybe there's somebody that you need to show compassion to or, or patience or, or maybe mercy. It could be with your kids. It could be in the office where you work. It could be in your marriage. It could be with a roommate or a teammate, a business partner where it dissolved in an ugly way a long time ago and you've never, you've never fixed it. Maybe with a family member. You, know, you want to do something special for someone this Christmas? Do what Paul said in Colossians 3. Take off the old and put on the new. Go back and find that individual, write them a card, send them an email, send them a text, but do some repair. You know what I said in our uh, The Power of the Tongue series, seven words that can kickstart any dead relationship. I was wrong, will you forgive me? It goes a long way. See, goodness and mercy, not just at the holidays, it should be a lifestyle. And then David concludes the psalm by saying this in verse six. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now remember, this is written from the perspective of a sheep. And up to this point, the sheep have been led, they've been guided, they've been made to feel safe so they can rest, so they, they can be restored. They've, they've been led through the darkest valleys up to the mountain ranges where they, could, where they could graze. But see, when the rainy seasons came, the heavy rains, the storm, the, the shepherd was forced to take his sheep back down the mountains to his home. 
where they were going to graze and they were going to stay. And when the shepherd would begin to take the sheep back down the mountains, they would get all excited because they knew they were going back down. They were, knew they were going to the shepherd's home. They knew they were going to the pasture. And, and if, if you've ever ridden a horse, it's the same way. You can ride a horse and ride a horse, but the minute you turn it back toward the barn, there's a, turn, there's a reason they say you're heading for the barn. That horse knows that, and he gets all fidgety. He wants to get home. The sheep are the exact same way. And the, the obvious analogy is this. One day as Christians, when this life is over, we get to go dwell in the house of our Lord forever. So let me ask you a question. Are you confident when you die that you'll dwell with God forever? Not only that, you get a little excited about it. Most people don't. We're kind of like that old Johnny Cash song. Everybody wants to go to heaven. But nobody wants to die. You heard that, right? Right. We all want to go to heaven. We just don't want to go through the journey which required to get there, right? Kind of reminds me of the little boy that was in church and the pastor said, who wants to go to heaven? And everybody raised their hand except the nine-year-old boy. He said, son, don't you want to go to heaven? He said, yeah, but I thought you were getting up a bus right now. I mean, that's, that's kind of, yeah, I want to go, but I don't want to go anytime soon because you know why? We don't really believe it. We don't understand what heaven's all about. Just, I'll just, I, 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 Laura and I talked about this and I'm, I'm going to share this with you. I shared a few weeks ago, I've been going through a little, little journey, had to have to get some biopsies and stuff. And uh, they sent me to see a specialist, and he said, honestly, Mike, I suspect you have cancer. But this is what we got to do. The day, and I, the day after Christmas, I have to go, they called me this week, I have to go to the Duke Cancer Center. T you what, when the Duke Cancer Center calls you, it gets real, right? It gets real. And I have to go in for this special MRI, and we'll know without a doubt one way or the other. And then we decide what it, how, well, how we deal with it. We just, that's the journey. That's the journey we're on right now. I'm only telling you this because everywhere I go, half of hope is there too. I mean, I do not live a private life. I go to the dog, hey, Mike's here. Everybody sit down. What are you in here for? I mean, it's just that kind of life. But anyway, you're going to find out people have already started. So I'm just asking you on December 25th, 6th, don't come up to me. Don't tell me. Just pray. Just pray about it, and we're going to work through it, get through it, whatever it is. But I got to tell you, every once in a while, when I was talking to Laura the other night, she said, you don't seem to be too stressed out about this. I said, I said, it's not a bad deal for me. I said, I feel bad for you and maybe the kids and the grandkids, and, but I, I get to go to heaven, you know. I said, I feel like every once in a while I stand up on my tiptoes and get just a little glimpse of it, you know, and, I get a little excited about it. That doesn't mean I'm not gonna, I wouldn't fight. She, you're not going to fight. I'm going to fight. But you know what? I win. Laura wins because she took out some huge insurance policies on me. <laughs> if I ever do go, you guys do an autopsy. And then the board at the church, they took out some key man policies. Everybody wins. The church is to pay it off. Laura's rich. I'm in heaven. I mean, it's a win, 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 right? Right? But let me ask you a question. Are you that confident? that when you finish your journey on this earth, you get to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let me tell you something. That's why you better understand the Christmas story. I mean, you gotta get this right. And if you don't think of it this way, 2,000 years ago, an angel shows up in Nazareth, tells a young teenage girl, you're gonna have a son, you're gonna name him Jesus, and guess what, here's the kicker, he's gonna be the savior of the world. And that is going to fulfill a prophecy that was made by a guy named Isaiah 900 years earlier when he said a virgin is going to have a child and he will be called what? Emmanuel. You know what that means? God with us. And I think God with us finally. And I say finally because when you think about it, this is a promise that God made to Abraham 2,000 years before Bethlehem. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, this is what it said. God says to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. That's the nation of the Jews. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And, those, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. In other words, Abraham, through you, is going to become the Messiah, Jesus, the Savior of the world. Think about it. That happened over 4,000 years ago. I mean, isn't that, I mean, it's unbelievable. And some of you are sitting here this weekend, you're like, ah, I don't know if the Bible's true. You know why you don't know the Bible's true? You never read it. You explain to me how this took over 2,000 years from the time God told Abraham it was going to happen to when it actually happened in Bethlehem. Not only that, 900 years before it happened in Bethlehem, Isaiah talked about it. A few hundred years before it happened in Bethlehem, Micah said, oh, by the way, one other detail is going to happen in Bethlehem. These guys never lived during the same time period. They never met each other. I mean, that's one conspiracy theory right there, right? 
But do you know why I think God took so long? Do you know why I think God said, Abraham, this is gonna happen, and then he waited 2,000 years? I think it's because God knew that there would be a bunch of skeptics in the 21st century going, I just don't know if it's true. But my point is simply this. Christmas is not a one-time isolated event. Christmas is just one little part of a multi-part episode that began over 4,000 years ago when God said to Abraham, I am not giving up on the human race. I am going to track it down. I am going to pursue it. I am going to birth a nation that's going to bring the Messiah. And that Messiah is going to offer salvation to every family, every generation that follows. And sure enough, 2,000 years after God told, made that promise to Abraham, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And what did Jesus do while he was on this earth? He went around saying, hey, let me tell you about God. God is like a shepherd who lost a sheep. And he pursued it. He searched high and low until he found that sheep. God is like a woman who had a valuable coin and she couldn't find that coin. She lost that coin and she turned her house upside down. She swept every square inch. She pursued that coin until she found it. God is like a father who lost a son, but he was committed to reconnecting with that son. That's what God is like. And Jesus proclaimed that message for three years. And then after living a sinless life, he's betrayed by Judas, he's arrested, he's falsely convicted, he's beaten within an inch of his life. He's nailed to a cross. Finally, after six hours, sometimes it lasted for days. So we could say graciously after six hours, Jesus said, it is finished. What was he saying? I've completed what I came here to do. I have paid the price for the sins of the world. Dropped the mic. Done. Took the punishment we deserved. Isaiah, we've looked at this passage in this series, chapter 53, verse 4. Surely he took up our pain, bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. You're wrong. You're wrong. That's not what was going on. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Here's our verse. We've looked at it several times. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Don't mess this up, people. That's the real story of Christmas. That's why Jesus came. That's the implication of Emmanuel, God with us. See, we think Emmanuel, God is after us. Emmanuel. God is mad at us. Emmanuel, God wants to crush us. Emmanuel, God can't be trusted. See, we got it all wrong. It's Emmanuel, God with us at last. It's a plan that began thousands of years ago. That's when the pursuit began. And I'm gonna tell you something. He's not gonna give up you now, on you now because he loves you. He is head over hills in love with you and he just wants to connect with you. So let me give you some advice this Christmas. And my advice is this, quit hiding from God. In other words, decide what's going on in my life that's keeping me from going face to face with God and just deal with it. Because let me tell you something, he is not gonna give up on you. He loves you too much. He's invested too much in the process. He wants a one-on-one intimate relationship with you. He's done unbelievable stuff to pave the way. Unbelievable stuff to make it possible. He's not gonna quit pursuing you now you just need to stop hiding from him in fact you know what i think god would say to some of you this weekend some of you have been hiding from god avoiding god for years because of a bad religious experience in your past maybe you grew up in a church and you saw how the religious leaders in that church taught uh, how, how they treated your parents or maybe you were treated that way or maybe you went to a, a church where the pastor was just an absolute jerk and you're like I I hate Christians I hate God I want nothing to do with you know what I think God would say I think he would say can we at least talk about it I mean don't avoid me because some religious person in your past was a jerk I think God would say you should read how the religious people treated my son I mean he's got the scars to show for it we actually have something in common but don't avoid me because of something that happened to you in church years ago God's like that's got nothing to do with me Some of you are still avoiding God because of your sin. God's like, come on, just try me. Just just put your cards on the table and let's talk about your sin and how you think I feel about it. Just try me because 
I've already dealt with your sin from my perspective. So let's talk about it. Some of you are avoiding God because you're mad at him. He didn't do something that you thought he should do. You know, he didn't handle something the way you thought he should handle it. Maybe you had a parent that died and you're like, God, why'd you do that for, to me? I prayed, and, I prayed and asked for healing and you let my parent die. Or I prayed and tried to save my marriage and you, you let my marriage die. And he didn't handle it the way you think he should have handled it. And because of that, you're angry at him, you're mad at him. But see, you've never taken your anger to God. You've just spent years hiding from God and avoiding God. Trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me. God can handle your anger. God can handle your disappointment. In fact, he would be honored. He would be honored if you would just bring it to him. You can, you can use any language you want. You can be as loud as you want. You can be as emotional as you want, but don't hide from him because he is relentless in his pursuit. He is not gonna give up on you. Some of you have been avoiding God and you're hiding from him because you think he'll reject you. Can I ask you a simple question? Why would he give his son? Why would God give his most priceless possession to die on the cross for you and then reject you? I mean, how screwed up is that, right? He has been pursuing you for thousands of years. Why in the world would he reject you now? So why don't you do yourself a favor this Christmas and quit hiding from God? See, he wants to be in a relationship with you. He's not gonna change his mind. He's got too much invested. There's too much at stake. See, he's ready for you to live the, live, to live the life he designed for you to live. One with purpose and meaning and forgiveness. One with a sense of peace, hope for a future. And then with this journey we call life is over, he wants you to know without a shadow of a doubt that you're gonna spend all eternity with him in a place called heaven. Understand, that's why we celebrate Christmas. It's not to light trees, although that's cool. It's not to give presents, although in some ways that is rewarding in itself. We celebrate Christmas because, see, that's when God became flesh and dwelt among us. And John said, man, as we watch, thinking back now, we beheld his glory. See, he came to us. He, he pursued us. Because he wants to connect with us. He wants to have the confidence. He wants you and I to have the confidence that when life on this earth is over, we get to dwell with him forever. And you know what? That's what you want. Deep down inside, that's what you want. Let's bow together. Let me just ask you a question. Have you ever accepted Jesus as your Savior? Transfer the trust from what you're trying to do to get into a relationship with God. See, that's religion. To what God has already done for you through his son, Jesus Christ. Man, if you haven't, make, just make the decision. Make the decision. If you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ <laughs> died on the cross and rose from the dead, Paul says, if you profess with your mouth, you're saved. You're saved. Make the decision. Say, God, I'm tired of running. Forgive me, I submit my life to you and he will change your life. And then tell somebody, tell somebody. Go to next steps, tell somebody. You may have been a Christian for years but you're hiding from God this weekend. You may be, maybe something happened in your life and you've lost trust in him. And you know what, I think we all go through that. Would you at least be willing to get along with God sometime this week and tell him how you feel? I don't care what kind of sin you're dealing with in your life. You don't have to be afraid. He's, a, he's your heavenly father, see, and he loves you. Father, thank you around this time of the year of just reminding us of the intensity of your love. And for those who are listening, whatever campus they're at right now, who don't trust you, I just pray you'll do something in their lives this week that will bring them one step closer to just laying it all out before you. Father, for the person who's been hurt by the system, I pray that they would just bring it to you. I pray that you would show them from your word how Jesus suffered the exact same thing. This is nothing new. This is nothing new. 
And Father, for the person who's mired in unbelievable sin, we know that you despise their sin, but it's not because you despise them. You despise their sin because it's preventing them from experiencing your best in their life. I just pray that they would have the courage to bring it to you. And for those of us who aren't even aware of the walls that are in our lives, I pray that you would reveal those walls that maybe we can't see and help us to come to you just as we are and help us to experience your love and forgiveness and grace in a way that absolutely changes our lives. And Father, we're going to give you the glory and the credit right now for what you're going to do. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's message. We are so excited to be a small part of all the great things that God is doing in and through your life. If you would like to take the next step in your spiritual journey, download the Hope app to find ways to connect, opportunities to serve, and other resources. And if you'd like to contribute financially to our vision of reaching the triangle and changing the world, visit us at gethope.net slash giving. Thank you for your commitment to resourcing hope as we love people where they are and encourage them to grow in their relationship with Jesus.